supernatural history? Well, we were talking about some pretty wondrous and amazing, mysterious things this week. We have been. Yes. We were just we talking about them yesterday. This is day five. Day five in the mystery of Christmas. The Wonder and Mystery of Christmas by Alistair Begg on you version. Supernatural history. What do we have for our beginning scripture today? While they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Luke 2, 6 and 7. If you've been listening this week, then you know we've been repeating these verses over and over, and the story to some may be getting old, but it never gets old. Because it's the most amazing story in the world. Mm -hmm. So hang in there with us. And let's continue. In the Gospel of Luke, no sooner has the author introduced himself as a detail-oriented historian, in Luke 1, 1 through 4, than we are immediately ushered into an environment filled with supernatural occurrences. Verses 11 through 17. The story of Jesus' birth is filled with angels, predictions, and miracles. And when Luke reports these events, he offers them not as imaginative stories or poetical speculations, but as they are, real history. That's one thing we have to understand about Luke. Luke was the detail-oriented facts, ma'am. I want the facts, ma'am. And he Mm -hmm. wrote it as a historical account, Yeah. not as dramatization. Right. He wrote it as he saw it and as it was. When we read that Mary laid her firstborn son, the very son of God, in a manger, it's because she did. When we read that the child she gave birth to was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit in Luke 1, 31-35, it's because he was. (laughs) Rather than being superfluous, These supernatural elements are an intrinsic part of the Gospel's account. Some have concluded that Jesus' birth narrative appears so dramatically supernatural that it's implausible. They don't believe it themselves or teach it to anybody else. They have decided that the story would be more acceptable to everybody if we simply removed anything miraculous. And that reminds me of the Jeffersonian Bible. Yes, I was just thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. President Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, Mm -hmm. great president. I think he was fantastic. Wrote the Federalist Papers. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. But he chose to cut and paste with scissors and glue pieces of the Bible out and put it into his own Bible. Yeah, because he couldn't... His human brain couldn't wrap his mind around anything miraculous. I guess he wanted to just eliminate anything miraculous or controversial, maybe. No, he, he wanted to eliminate it because he didn't believe it. It was mm. sad. Yeah. But that cannot be done. The story of the gospel is supernatural in its entirety. And not just at its beginning, but because it is the story of the creator of the universe entering into time, revealing himself as savior and king. That's the reason. Mm -hmm. Surely it would be more bizarre if the Almighty God did not enter and exit the world in entirely supernatural ways that made mere mortals scratch their heads in amazement indeed. In each of supernatural incidents Luke recorded, some faithful people had reflected on the scriptures and were keenly anticipating that God would break into their environment in a way that had never happened before and would never happen again. When God came, these were the people who were ready for God to come and do what only he could do. These were the people who responded in faith. Hmm. Christianity is ultimately meaningless apart from the almighty, miraculous intervention of God in time. Mm -hmm. God has come to meet us, but not at the top of the towers. We have created on the strength of our ideas and investigation into what is plausible. He came to meet us in a cattle shed in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. 
He came to meet us on a Roman cross at Calvary. Mm. He works in ways that we cannot explain and cannot predict. Mm. Yeah, it reminds me of the scripture that just remind you know just tells us that that my ways are not, not your, your ways, ways, and mm-hmm. you will never understand them. Lean not on your own understanding. Right. As you reflect on God's word during this Advent season, consider His divine work which has already been accomplished, and the ways he continues to move today. In doing so, your heart will once again be stirred by the wonder of the triune God's supernatural love for you. Your eyes will be prepared to see surprising ways that God is at work in you and around you, ways that you cannot explain and had not predicted, but love to enjoy and praise him for. So once again, how is God calling me to think differently? How is God reordering my heart's affections, what I love? And what is God calling me to do as I go about my day today? But when the fullness of the time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Mm, Thank you, Jesus. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. And Lord, thank you for this word Mm -hmm. and this plan, this perfect, mysterious plan. If it sounds too crazy to be true, this is the one time when you can just let it go and say, just because it was. It's the way it was. Lord, help us to just be still and know that you are God, you created things, and that you created us for your glory. Help us, Lord, to be instruments of your glory. Help us to understand and to share this Christmas story with others in a way that's meaningful enough to make a difference in their eternal salvation. Mm -hmm. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much and we ask everyone to just be merry this Christmas and help to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.